Alright, well, uh, Fred and I are making our way through the jungle here in Saipan. And, uh, I gotta say, it's giving me an all new respect for the soldiers and Marines who fought here. Because, man, the heat is suffocating. And uh, this is a rough country. But anyway, 1944. Whenever battle was raging here, get through this stuff, the Japanese kept falling further and further north until they got to where we're at right now on the northern part of the island. And the Japanese general who was in command of forces here, a guy by the name of General Saito, had his command post right up here, his final command post, where he was going to issue a final order that was going to lead to the pretty much destruction of the Japanese forces here on Saipan. So all of this vegetation that we're looking at right here, this stuff is something called velvet bean, which apparently is worse than poison ivy or poison oak. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're trying to tiptoe our way through this stuff without rubbing up against it. Okay. <laughs> Well, Fred and I continue to hack our way through this jungle, which has been something else. Take a look at what we just found. So something was going on up here in 1944. We just found a little bit of unexploded ordnance. Looks like an American grenade right here. Uh, I can't tell if the fuse is still in it or not. It doesn't look like it is. I think we're going to leave it alone, though. Oh, man. Ooh, stuck. Pretty steep. Actually, that's doable. Yeah. Just watch out for dead branches okay okay uh, I'll tell you what I've been up Curahee Mountain what we just went through was every bit as hard if not harder than that it's kind of like going up Curahee over uneven terrain and fighting through jungle under canopy stuff vines 
Uh, couldn't show it all on camera, but this has been rough. But I think it's worth it because we have found the cave of General Saito where he had his very last command post. All right, one last ascent here. And holy cow, I'll tell you what, I am whooped right now. Uh, but yeah, it looks like we have some sort of armored barrier out front. And uh, there's a spot here on this island that's called the last command post. And it's not really the last command post. This is it right here. But dang, I don't know how people would get to it knowing what we just went through. All right, we're going to get up here. And, uh, oh, maybe break out a light and take a look in there. Well, <laughs> maybe we won't be going back in this cave. Um, Apparently, it has either collapsed or has been sealed off. Uh, but anyway, this is where on either late June 6th or really, really early on June 7th, um, General Saito of the 43rd uh, Division for the Japanese and the 31st Army Chief of Staff, uh, General Aigita, uh, were staged up in this cave right here and uh, Saito decided that, that he was uh, going to commit suicide here um, and one of his last orders was for a, uh, a final bonsai charge uh, against the American lines uh, something called uh, Gyokasai did I get that right Fred? Gyokasai? Okay. I have trouble pronouncing things sometimes. But anyway, uh, Gyokasai translates to something called breaking the jewel. And this is where uh, a unit is obligated to basically destroy themselves in the final attack. So each Japanese soldier was charged with taking out 10 U.S. soldiers or Marines uh, before he died. And then uh, Saito and Aijita and a third staff officer. There are some stories that Admiral Nagumo from uh, the hero, Japanese hero uh, from Pearl Harbor uh, was here as well. Um, some say that he was elsewhere, but anyway, uh, they thrust a blade into their stomachs and then were shot in the head. But right here in this cave is where it all happened. All right, we're gonna move down now to where the uh, bonsai charge took place. All right, we've uh, moved uh, a little south now into uh, a ravine that since the battle has become known as Harakiri Gulch. Uh, now, the, the reason that this area has that name is uh, as the 105th Infantry Regiment of the 27th Infantry Division was, was pushing up uh, to the north of Saipan, they got to this area and there were a couple of companies that, that were detached to, to kind of clear out uh, this ravine and as they were descending along you know this um, it'd be the southern face they started hearing explosions in this area and what it was was Japanese soldiers who may have been wounded or who couldn't continue the fight uh, who were pulling the pins or grenades holding it up to either their heads or their chest and blowing themselves up so so this gully here became known as Harakiri Gulch and on the bonsai charge that was going to take place on July 7th this was one of the areas where the Japanese were going to be staging up and launching this brutal attack uh, on the American troops. All right, I'm just gonna show a few things here in uh, Harakiri Gulch. Okay, so I'm kind of moving into the uh, fringes of the, the jungle now. 
and here if I can get around some of this foliage okay right here you can kind of see this this ditch or this drainage that kind of forms the spine of Harakiri Gulch and if I go over here maybe looks like you can kind of see again it's kind of dark in here but but you can kind of see how this rises up and forms this funnel that kind of runs east-west or not kind of runs east-west it does run uh, in an easterly and westerly direction and uh, would dump right into the the plains on the western side of the island all right got something else here that uh, that I want to show before we leave All right, making our way up through some fairly thick stuff to the base of this cliff. Oh man, I'm hung up on something. All right. All right, here at the uh, base of this cliff and uh, Fred brought me up here yesterday, so so I've already had a chance to kind of look some of this over. But look at here. Here at the base of this cliff have some of the uh, detritus of war. Also, I think that's a Japanese knee mortar. Um, and then just like little parts and, and pieces. And then, look at this. Got a couple of casings from an artillery round here. A couple broken shards of uh, like dinnerware. Hmm. Here are a couple more items. Looks like we got a bunch of old shell casings. A little grommets off of maybe uh, uniforms I'm guessing piece of a uh, gas mask here's the actual bullet right here looks like all things that have been collected and stacked up right here at this cliff One of the things that I've been forced to consider as I've been spending time here on Saipan is that there's more than just the American perspective to this battle. Uh, there's also you know, the, the native perspective and also the Japanese perspective. The, the Japanese consider this to be a sacred place. Just as much as Americans might like to travel here and you know, see the places where uh, the, the Marines and the Army fought, well, it holds deep significance to the Japanese as well. As a matter of fact, right here in this very spot is where a number of Japanese soldiers uh, committed suicide towards the end of the Battle of Saipan. And even today, the, the Japanese come to this place to remember and honor their dead. So as I mentioned, right here in this very spot, is where a number of Japanese soldiers ended their own lives in the Battle of Saipan. And their descendants and the people of Japan still come here today to this very spot to remember and honor those soldiers. So if you look, these are different Japanese prayer sticks that have been left here and then they've also got these paper cranes that are strung up in this place to uh, remember the Japanese soldiers that died here. Very, very interesting.
All right, we're gonna make our way back through the brush now and uh, go back down the gulch uh, to, to the west into the plains where the largest bonsai attack of World War II took place. Okay, so uh, I've moved down to the mouth of Harakiri Gulch and uh, you're gonna have to kind of work with me on this one. Uh, the undergrowth is so thick down here that even if I were to, to go in, you wouldn't be able to see anything. The, the best way that I can show what was going on here is to be right here by the road. So I'm out here holding the camera, pointed at myself, looking like an idiot. But uh, anyway, on uh, July the 6th, the, the end was in sight for U.S. forces on the eastern side of the island, which is off to my left here. The 4th uh, Marine Division was, was pushing north. Uh, and they were going to be creating a, a little bit of a pocket that the 27th Infantry Division was going to have to clear out. So uh, the uh, 105th uh, Infantry Regiment under the leadership of a guy named McCarthy was sent here to push what Japanese were left out of this pocket. So right now we are looking towards the south and the, the men from the 105th Infantry Regiment would have been advancing up this way uh, in the same direction that these cars are coming from. And as they approached the mouth of Harakiri Gulch, well, they would have come under some withering fire right up here in this ditch. So, so this ditch right here forms kind of like the, the spine of, of Harakiri Gulch. And it was completely filled with Japanese defenders who were waiting on these guys from the 105th. And uh, they were causing all kinds of problems. Uh, eventually there were three uh, Stuart tanks who ended up joining the fight and one of them was commanded by a guy named Lieutenant Dory. Uh, so I, I've heard this called Dory's Ditch. Uh, as they were approaching, one of the, the tanks got knocked out. Uh, the third one stayed behind to kind of uh, assist and defend it. And Dory just worked all up and down this line, firing into this ditch and completely uh, laying waste to the Japanese defenders. Uh, I, I read one account where a guy said afterwards you could literally walk across this ditch on the backs of the Japanese dead. Not figuratively speaking, literally speaking. It was kind of like the, the wheat field uh, in Gettysburg. Uh, but anyway, after that engagement was over things settled down for a little bit and a guy from another unit came up to, to right here uh, around this point and one of the guys from the 105th said that he didn't know what was going on but something was about ready to burst he said we've been killing japanese all day and and they just keep coming and uh what was getting ready to happen was going to be something ugly but yeah, that engagement on July 6th happened right here. So by the evening of July 6th, the 105th Infantry Regiment had, had pushed up past the ditch and had made their way north and formed a perimeter that came all the way out, uh, kind of to the, the edge of the beach where I am at now on the, the western side of the island. And in the early morning hours on July the 7th, uh, all hell broke loose as the Japanese started pouring in by the, the hundreds and hundreds uh, into the, the thousands, just slamming into the line. Now they came along this beach right here, so I'm, I'm facing north right now, this is south, so they would have been coming you know, towards where I'm at right now. But the main axis of advance was more inland along the old railroad track. Fred is finding all kinds of cool stuff here. What is that? 
Well, uh, I'm not sure about the English name, but uh, the local name is Dogus. Dogus? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and check this out. In addition to uh, this little Dogus thing, look what else he found. Right here at the water's edge. There's a bullet. How crazy is that? One thing that I read is that during the bonsai attack, uh, a lot of Japanese were, were making their way out into the water and kind of making their way out towards the, the reef. Uh, so it's very possible that uh, that bullet might have been fired by some guy from the 105th Infantry Regiment right here and uh, he just happened to miss. Man, that is wild. Now, for the spot that we are in right now, we're going to have to use our imaginations a little bit because this area looks different. So right now, uh, this is all grown up in this real heavy, like, switch grass or, or blade grass, I've heard it called. Uh, during the Battle of Saipan, uh, this would have all been sugarcane fields. And servicing the sugarcane industry here there would have been a railroad that would have ran right through here so so the rail lines aren't there now uh, they've either been pulled up and repurposed uh, or or they've been buried uh, i've seen pieces of the, the rail lines all over this island but anyway this was going to form the main axis of the final bonsai charge of the battle of saipan and if we Try and look over this blade grass a little bit. You can just imagine that on the night, or the early morning hours rather, of July 7th, Japanese soldiers by the thousands pouring out of these hills and filtering down into the Tanapag Plain here and slamming right into the 105th Infantry Regiment. As I'm walking through here, I'm, I'm trying to just imagine what this must have looked like and felt like to, to these poor infantry soldiers who were looking out here to, to the north. And really, well, it would have been dark, but hearing and, and seeing as flares were going up, just thousands of, of Japanese screaming and charging their lines with rifles and with grenades and with swords and pitchforks and sharpened uh, sticks, you know, anything that they could find. It, it had to have been horrifying. Uh, but the 105th Infantry Regiment, uh, 1st and 2nd Battalion, ended up getting pushed back uh, by about a thousand yards uh, just from this insane number of uh, Japanese who were attacking their lines and uh, again this had to be the scene of, of some insane terror and was also the scene of some uh, really unbelievable acts of heroism including a guy by the name of Benjamin Solomon. So Benjamin Solomon was the regimental dentist for the 105th Infantry Regiment of the 27th Infantry Division. And uh, well, here at the Battle of Saipan, uh, in, the, in the heat of all of the action, uh, there wasn't really much need for a dentist. So whenever the 2nd Battalion surgeon got wounded, uh, Solomon volunteered to fill his spot. And in the early morning hours of uh, July 7th, he was uh, staged uh, about between 50, 75 yards behind you know, the, the foxholes. We, we don't know exactly where it's at. And again, it's so thick here that I don't know if we could even find where those foxholes are. Uh, but whenever the uh, bonsai attack was launched, well, Solomon's aid station filled up pretty quick. And Japanese started pouring into the tent. He was helping to, to fight them off. And uh, whenever he realized that they were in a hopeless situation, 
he ordered the the ambulatory wounded uh, to to fall back. He ended up manning a machine gun and was helping to hold off the Japanese that were pouring out of these hills and slamming into their lines. Now, whenever the battle, I'm sorry, whenever the the charge was over and they went back, well, Benjamin Solomon was dead right there by the machine gun that he had manned. And in front of him were 98 dead Japanese soldiers. Uh, Benjamin Solomon himself uh, had been shot over 75 times. Uh, he had multiple uh, bay bayonet wounds, uh, many of which had been inflicted while he was still alive. And uh, Solomon would posthumously be awarded the Medal of Honor, along with several other men, for the acts of heroism that they displayed here on July 7th, 1944. One thing that you'll notice right here in this area is there's no development, no buildings, no parking lot, nothing. Just this tall blade grass that it really kind of obscures the view. And there's a, a reason why there are no buildings here. It's because right now we're standing on top of a mass grave of Japanese soldiers that just completely fill this area. Uh, in total, I, I've seen different numbers, anywhere between three to 4,000 uh, Japanese soldiers who were killed in, in what became the largest bonsai attack of World War II. Just absolutely uh, a horrifying thing. Uh, a few days later, on July the 9th, the Marines would make their way up to Marpy Point, and uh, hostilities on Saipan were officially uh, said to have been concluded. But tragically, there was still more death that was going to occur in this place. We'll be talking about that in the next episode.